Hey everybody, Jonathan Baylor back with another SANE show. Very excited about today's show because uh, a new guest and someone who I had the pleasure of meeting in person recently, and this gentleman has to be one of the nicest human beings I've ever met. It was just like, who are you and, and where did you come from and, and how can I move there? Because if everyone is as nice as you, then uh, I need to be around them. His name is Dr. Alan Christensen. He's the author of the upcoming Adrenal Reset Diet. He is amazingly sane and I'm so happy to have him with us today. Dr. Christensen, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing awesome. Thanks so much for having me, Jonathan. Well, well Dr. Christensen, uh, tell us a little bit about your journey from, from little Alan to now big official Dr. Christensen. <laughs> you know, the journey went the way that it did because little Alan wasn't all that little. <laughs> 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 you know, I was a, as a kid, I had seizures and I had some problems with movement and it led me to get pretty obese. And somewhere around seventh grade was the real low point of that. Mm. You know, I got called out in gym class about my shape in ways that I didn't want to be called out on. And, mm. And it kind of hit me that, wow, I really needed to change this and I had to make a difference in some way. And, you know, I got stacks of books and I was able to go through these books and and change it, make make a difference. And it led me into medicine. And in medicine, I found that there's a lot of people that have thyroid disease or conditions like adrenal dysfunction, metabolic syndrome. And a lot of folks are struggling with these issues. And the stuff that worked for me is not always enough. So I wanted to help make it make a bigger impact and find more explanations behind it. And what, so what, tell us, so you, you were, you were in seventh grade, you started doing this reading, you started doing this research when you went into a formal kind of traditional medical practice or, or tell us about how the, the medical field journey progressed. You know, the plan was, the plan was medicine, but I really wanted to tie nutrition into it. Mm -hmm. As a kid, I was taken to doctors and I was given treatments and whatnot it didn't help me with my weight and mm -hmm. it didn't help with a lot of other my health issues and I had the realization that after about age 13 when I saw things start to turn around you know some random kid with library books could get more traction than doctors were giving <laughs> and I thought what kind of world is this <laughs> you know how can this be so I was really motivated to go into a practice that focused on key hormone conditions mm -hmm. but to really do it in a way that integrated diet you know because that was that was my game changer i knew that was critical and what have you what have you seen to be the biggest differences between what you were taught in more of the conventional medical practice and what you have found through your own independent research and independent practice to be this is the conventional wisdom but this is what actually works well the conventional wisdom right now is trying really hard to make sense out of this pending obesity crisis. You know, we're looking at two-thirds of the humans on the planet being overweight, obese, or morbidly obese in just a little over a decade. Uh, the trends are just, if anyone's looking at them, they're scared to death. You know, we're talking about bankrupting global economies because of the healthcare costs from this. Mm -hmm. And the conventional model is saying, you know, I had a one physiology professor, he took us through about two weeks of all the research to date on obesity. And there's like the one called the Mona Lisa hypothesis. I you heard that one, but at the very end of it, one of my kind of wise ass classmates sitting next to me, <laughs> he's like, okay, so the last two weeks, what it came down to is fat people are lazy liars. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's what the research, when you really get down to it, they say that people misrepresent their food intake and they're less active than they should be. Mm. And that just does not fit the data anymore. Mm -hmm. And everyone's trying to chase this dead end model. You know, I'm so glad to be here with your audience and partnering with you. You've talked about how the calories are a myth and that's what it is. There's more factors behind it. And that's what I really wanna have people understand. And let's start to dig into those factors because you're exactly right that I, I agree with you wholeheartedly that part of the reason we have seen this obesity epidemic rise is because this is seen as a moral failing of people, not a scientific problem. And if it's just a moral failing, well, then we can say, well, those people are stupid and lazy. Let's go move on to more important things. But you and I both know it's not about stupidity and laziness, and there's very little else that's more important than this, given the scope of the problem. So what, what are the underlying causes where we have individuals who are dieting, who are eating 1,200, 1,400 calories, who are just as active as everyone else, but can't seem to halt weight 
gain or enjoy weight loss? Yeah, I'll share with you kind of what went on inside my head trying to figure this thing out over the years. You know, I, I saw a lot of research that was looking at different theories. You know, some talked about this new concept of obesogens. You know, there's chemicals that trigger weight gain, you know, independent of food intake. And I found that really compelling. We had a family trip to Thailand one year and you, you couldn't breathe the air. It was so bad in Bangkok and everybody was skinny. So I'm like, ah, oh, this doesn't fit. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of theories like that. You know, the obesogens, the fructose, the heightened load of mental, emotional stress, many things that disrupt the circadian rhythm. There's a lot of really good theories that are very compelling and they explain a lot of it. But there's a lot of ways in which any one of them doesn't quite make it all the way connect. Mm. And I realized that, wow, maybe there's not one thing, one cause, but there could be one shared mechanism. Mm. You know, is there one, one way that the body responds to all these different types of triggers? And so if it's not the same trigger for each person, there could be one same shift that occurs from all these factors that have increased in the last few decades. And so what have you seen those common denominators be where there, there could be many different causal factors, but the underlying trigger or switch that they flip is the same. And if we could understand that, maybe we could, maybe we could kind of uh, do an end around and get around it somehow, or, or what do we do then? <laughs> that was the thought process. And I, I vividly remember the moment of having all these piles of studies around me actually in this room and, then, and trying to literally connect them in some way and realizing that there was a connection mm -hmm. that our body has very elegant mechanisms to survive famine. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you take humans and throw them outside and take away their food, there's predictable metabolic shifts that go on that we hold on to the calories we've got around our belly fat. And we might even take away some muscle tissue to build more of that during times of crisis. And the epiphany I had was that all these things that, you know, some of which you could see obviously as stressors like mental emotional stress, but many that you might not at first glance, the chemicals, the fructose, all these things put us in this survival state. Mm. They all cause us to go into this storage mode and they do so by hijacking this delicate cycle of our adrenal hormones. Mm. And have you seen, so I, I think someone just casually listening, maybe they're doing some vacuuming while they're listening, they hear <laughs> adrenal hormones and they think adrenaline. So yeah. they think people who are, are really stressed, and this might be a really silly analogy, I just thought of it in the moment, but so if we think about maybe a, a monk or a, a someone who is very, very calm and serene and doesn't, we wouldn't think has much adrenaline going on in their body. Uh, these people aren't all thin. And so, and so kind of help us understand what you mean when you say uh, adrenal reset, adrenal glands, what actually causes those to go out of whack and, and what we can do to get them back in whack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great point. It's, it is more than just the perceived mental, emotional stress. You yeah. know, that can be a factor for some, but there's many factors besides that. Mm. There's a rhythm in our bodies and there's actually a rhythm in our fat. So crazy stuff that you could pull the fat around from someone's organs put it in a Petri dish and keep it living, and you could measure its daily rhythm. You could mm. measure its clock. And it's got a clock that's separate from your body's central regulating clock. It's got its own little thing going. Mm -hmm. The more visceral fat someone has, the more their clock is out of rhythm with their brain's governing clock. Mm. So the fat is working off of the adrenal hormones. Mm. And when this delicate rhythm of cortisol, which we make more of to wake us up, we shut it off to go to sleep. When that's off, the fat timing gets disturbed and we're in storage mode. Hmm. And this is a really a transformational understanding, I think, for folks. And you mentioned something about taking fat out, putting it in a Petri dish and popping up even a level from that. I know uh, nowadays, and this is this wasn't always the case, but recently in the scientific literature, it's, it's pretty much a fact, again, correct me if I'm wrong, that fat is a, it's not just a passive storage repository for calories, but I bet 99.9% .9 of people who struggle with excess fat believe that the purpose of fat and the function of fat, the sole function is basically like a bank account. It's a calorie bank account and mm -hmm. calories just sit there. Yeah. But what we're actually finding out is it's, it's a endocrine organ. It is, it is part of the system. So tell us a little bit more about how we should perceive 
body fat. Yeah, it, you're exactly right. It's an endocrine organ. It, it makes it makes some hormones. It's also a circadian endocrine organ. It's got a daily rhythm to it. And there's so much interconnectedness between many big parts of the body, but the fat's main tie is really the adrenal hormones. Mm. So your adrenal hormones, I mentioned cortisol, that's one of the stronger hormones they make. They also make a real weak hormone called cort cortisone. So we've got cortisone, O-N-E, and cortisol, O-L. So weak cortisone is always coming out. And strong cortisol comes out in this rhythm. Now, the connection is that your fat can actually take cortisone and make cortisol out of it. Mm. <laughs> or it can do the opposite. So when it's healthy, it does that in a way that allows you to generate energy and keep enough reasonable amount of fat, but not to have it grow out of control. Mm -hmm. But once that conversion gets thrown off, your body's locked into this spiral of storing more and more fat and making more stress hormones from your fat. Wow, this is another a great example. Uh, I love this because it's concrete science and the concept that uh, the listeners and viewers of this show will be familiar with is we talk about a hormonal clog or a metabolic clog and this, this, this homeostatic interplay that should be taking place in your body starts to break down and the communication breaks down. And so it, it sounds like we're, here we're digging into the specific adrenal components of that. And what have you, have you found that like what, what's the treatment for that? What are the lifestyle modifications we make to get that back in line? You know, and that perfect question. That was kind of like my, my next thought press. Okay, so this <laughs> is what's happening. What are we gonna do about it? You know, we, we can't all become monks like you alluded to. We can't be in this perfect, pristine environment with like no EMFs and no pollutants or nothing else. And I also thought, you know, we've got to eat as well. You know, I think diet is a very big thing psychologically as well as physiologically. You know, along with just the stressors of, of struggling with one's weight, there's a whole lot of cognitive mental trauma about what to eat, mm -hmm. you know, and always feeling like, wow, this might not be right for this reason. This might not be right for that reason. And I thought, how cool would it be if we could get clarity about a simple regime for eating mm -hmm. that could also coax back these rhythms and bring these cycles back into line again? So I used the idea about cortisol also regulating blood sugar. Mm. And there's data showing that the ratios of our protein, fat, and our carbs can have effects upon our cortisol rhythms. Mm. So I thought, wow, wouldn't it be awesome if we could make these ratios and then kind of time them throughout the day to help the body get reset back to an ideal cortisol rhythm again. Mm. So healthy foods, clean foods. But the unique new aspect is that having a specific timing regime for them so that they could retrain the body back to a rhythm that made it burn and produce energy better. Fascinating. So it's it's still the baseline of nutrient density, but what we now vary and we add to the mix is the when. And is this, the title of your book is The Adrenal Reset Diet. So is this, would we have to think about the timing of our eating for uh, just until we're reset and then we can kind of stop thinking about it? Or is, it, is this a, a long-term lifestyle change? Tell us a little bit more about that. You know, that's the cool thing. And boy, it's been coming up on 20 years of medical practice now. And I've, I've really developed this, this belief and this experience that in a good state of health, our bodies maintain homeostasis, mm -hmm. you know, that we, we can do that. So you're right, the more stable we are, the more easily we can stay stable, the more, the more stress resilient we are, and the more we can buffer against untoward factors. And we saw this, we did a clinical trial of this, of this diet, and we saw that in just a month, we could see this huge measurable shift by more than 58% of the adrenal rhythm only on the diet. Mm. And when someone does have the rhythms back in line again, they are measurably more stress resilient. Mm. And, and yes, they have more autonomy and more leeway over their habits. And of course, you can still wreck things if you try to. <laughs> <laughs> But it's easier to balance when you're moving than when you're not moving. <laughs> gotcha, like gotcha. On a bike. So, so it's a bit like we're we're gonna have to go at a level ten out of ten for a time period to get reset, and then as that as the system as the homeostasis takes over, we might be able to ease back. Of course, we're not gonna start eating insane garbage, but thinking about um, when during the day we're eating it, would that become more lax then over time? People get more leeway when they're stable. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing too is that 
you know, some of the hard parts about dieting would be just the hunger, the food cravings, but also things like mood changes, fatigue, insomnia, they come about from that. Mm -hmm. And I argue in the book that those are consequences, sure, of just being restricted of food, but they're also consequences of having your daily cycle goofed up mm -hmm. and having your cortisol rhythms thrown off. So when you're eating in a way to improve that, people pretty routinely said that, you know, wow, I mean, first, first off, this is working, which is cool, but not only that, I'm actually feeling better as I'm losing weight, which is kind of an unprecedented for most people. <laughs> Absolutely, and it sounds like it would also be getting easier over time versus the longer you try to live on a thousand calories per day, the harder it gets over time. So can you give us just in big, big, broad brush strokes, if, if right now uh, we're in a place where we, we like eating sane foods, where, you know, vegetables, clean proteins, whole food fats, healthy stuff found in nature, what, what is the high level brush we would paint over top of that right before we buy your book <laughs> to start, <laughs> to start uh, modifying the timing of those foods? You know, one of the general concepts is having good, healthy carbs, like you've taught everyone about, having those types of good carbs later in the day rather than earlier. Mm. And there, there have been some experts who've talked about having carbs early when you burn them, but it turns out that it takes a long time to get them ready to burn. So actually like eight to 14 hours. Mm. So what we burn in the course of a given day is less so from our breakfast and more so from our prior evening meals. You know, some have argued that there's this historical rhythm of our ancestors to where we were probably hunting and gathering throughout the day and not consuming major amounts of food during daylight, mm -hmm. you know, but then come early evening, make a communal campfire and gather together and, you know, have our social bonding time, protect from our predators. And that was the time we would have our larger meal. Mm -hmm. So in the evening, we respond to food in ways that are very different than we do earlier in the day. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say take a diet that's not working and throw a lot of extra food before bed. <laughs> <laughs> but it is it is very counter, which I always find to be encouraging. When something sounds dissimilar to what has failed us for the past 40 years, I say, hmm, well, that might lead a, to a different result, which is good because the <laughs> conventional wisdom, right, is, man, if you eat basically anything after 6 p.m., you're going to get fat. I mean, you just can't eat, you know, it's eat a eat eat this starchy breakfast. So it's like load up on your carbs in the morning and then don't eat anything in the evening. And it sounds like you're, you're almost flipping that. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, there was a real cool study I saw about some Israeli military and they were put on equal calorie diets. But the only difference in this study was just when the calories came in. Hmm. And one group had a greater quantity of them in the evening than earlier. And that group had a fat loss of 15% above the group that had the same food earlier in the day. Mm. So there's, there's something to it. And it really does fit what we're learning about the body's rhythms and our cycles of storage and burning. You know, early in the day, our food is going to get more stored as fat. Later in the day, when it's timed well, we're going to build healthy glycogen out of it. And also just big picture, I'm certainly a fan of solid breakfast. I'm a fan of having lunch and eating as need be, but just kind of having the bulk of that be at a time when it will support relaxation and sleep and support generation of fuel for the following day. When it's very good news as well, because I think most people won't struggle to eat more food in the evening. I, it, it, at least, at least that's been my, I mean, I probably consume 60 to 70% of the calories I consume over the course of a day, just because I listen to my body after 6 PM. That's just naturally, I know that's how my father works. Wow. Um, so are, and are we, are we just big, broad brush strokes? Are we basically saying, you know, baseline of clean foods, baseline of sane foods, and then we're going, uh, more of them, later in the day and and we're going uh, kind of higher fat lower carb early in the day and mm -hmm. higher carb lower fat later so you're just kind of skewing that as the day goes totally if you've got it right on brilliant and have what have you seen to be if any the one or two 
uh, maybe stumbling blocks where if people just hear the cliff notes, you know, someone's like, Hey, I read this book called the Eugenio reset diet. And you do this and you'd be like, no, that's not what it says. <laughs> you know, <laughs> What would be the two cautions you would want to give people? Probably the first one, like I said, was just not to take a diet that's not working and throw a lot of extra food onto it. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in the evening. He said, load up on carbs in the evening. So let's go to Dunkin' Donuts. Let's get a dozen donuts and eat them after 9 PM. And then you'll lose weight. Right? <laughs> yeah. You know, an another one would be really the context of one's sleep habits. Mm. We're getting more data about, we've always struggled about like diet and exercise for weight. And it might be the case that sleep is a bigger variable. Mm -hmm. You know, there's more mounting evidence about that. So putting a lot of thought into one's rhythms, one's schedules, one's downtime, you know, bright light in the morning, winding down in the day. So ignoring one's sleep and dialing in all the rest. So the, the rhythms are huge. That's an important part of it. Well, brilliant. Well, I think we've got folks some some wonderful teaser information here. They can take their existing sane lifestyle, do some experimentation with doing uh, if you're going to have your fats, try to have those earlier in the day. If you're going to incorporate some more carbs, do those later in the day and don't feel bad if you're hungry in the evening about enjoying a big meal. Then where can folks learn the details of this? How can they get your book? Well, we're going to give a whole bunch of them away. You know, I want to get this message out and I want to make a big, big difference on this. So this is something that can really shift the global perspective on it. And we're going to do a giveaway process. And I'm actually want to, we're going to have some great bonuses from you as well as part of it. And so where can we, so I'm sorry, you're, you're giving, you're giving this book away. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> you know, I will ask for a little help with shipping and handling just a bit, but honestly, we're, we're going to give it away. We want to get the message out in a quick way and, and have the, the discussions and the thoughts about obesity start to really change. Yeah. Excellent. Well, folks, we will send out a link where you can get all the information on where you can get free copy of the book plus shipping and handling, which is certainly a better deal than you're going to get from any other place in the world. So that's pretty awesome. And, and Dr. Christensen, if you have any parting words, uh, what, what would those be? You know, what I've seen is that our bodies can heal and our bodies are really driven back towards this amazing state of thriving. And if you've ever been in a place to where it's not where you want it to be, don't ever give up and don't ever think that it cannot improve because it, it really can. There's only just a matter of undoing the things holding you back and providing the things that are gonna move you forward. And with, with those steps, you can really achieve the, the health that you want. Well, Dr. Christensen, thank you so much for that inspirational message and also for all the amazing science and clinical practice that you bring to the table to back that up. I so appreciate your time. <laughs> Thanks again for having me, Jonathan. Well, listeners and viewers, again, our wonderful guest today is the always delightful and insightful Dr. Alan Christensen. The book you heard about today is The Adrenal Reset Diet. Of course, make sure you're signed up at sanesolution.com, and I'll send you a link on how you can actually get a free copy of that book, which is pretty awesome. And again, a, a great book to read. Also, look up Dr. Christensen online. Just type in Dr. Alan Christensen because a, a, great, a, a great individual in the field of look, this isn't about starving yourself. It's about healing yourself. And once you heal yourself, it's literally a new you moving forward. And that, that really changes the game, right? It's not about starvation. It's about healing. And so we, we got to support anyone who's saying that message, especially someone as nice as Dr. Christensen. So be sure to check that out. And remember, stay sane.